Hello, Warriors. Hope everyone had a good weekend. Hi, Alexander. Who's Rick? Warren, uh, thanks. Uh, doing a shade better. Jeff Hansen, how are you? Hugo. Hi, Scott. How are you, bro? Let's take a look around. Richard Adams, how are you? <clears throat> oh, Ryan. Okay. So we're getting a little risk off here so far today. And uh, Euro's a little bit weaker. Here's the way I see Euro. And it looks like it's going to challenge it. Uh, as long as we hold 1750, we're okay. All right. That's a pivot now. So. If we take it out, I'm looking for one more new low before we get a better rally. Yeah, uh, Dale, I can't, I can't see your screen. Yeah. How about morning. now? Morning. So. Hey, there you go. You got it. Okay, so yeah, here's that pivot. This was, you know, a breakdown, a false breakdown, and to me, it's an important level for it to hold. Otherwise, you know, perhaps we're going to get one more rally in uh, Dixie. You know, up here, we did have a confirmed high in the Dixie. One more high and then a better correction. Even though uh, the dollar's stronger, the yen can't mount much of a rally. And Canada's pretty strong. Aussie looks like it's getting ready to make a new low for this formation. I think we have... Uh, uh, I don't know if it's the Aussie or the Kiwi. We have Central Bank, uh, Central Bank meeting this week. Kiwi, it's the Kiwi. RBNZ. Yep. Okay. And they're expected you. to they're expected to hike first one. Okay, it's got a better looking chart than Aussie, so we'll see what happens there. E.g., uh, you know, a little bounce. It looked like you know we we're back over the throw over, but if the euro is going to make one more low. I don't think the pound will. I think the pound will hold this low. Okay, even if the euro makes a new low, say to sixteen eighty or something like that. Um, gold giving some of it back. Much stronger rebound in gold than silver. Still looks that way. Uh, maybe the gold uh, around seventeen forty. I'd be watching that because uh, that was kind of the target from this. Formation, even though it overshot, and oil better uh, dig in its heels here above this blue line of 550, or we could have a breakdown. Cat is a pair. Yes, that's what I mean, John. Hi, Sinatra. How are you? So, in here, we always talk about the pairs. Uh, that's what we're trading. You might be trading futures. Um, so uh, that's any questions on any of the looks. Uh, we pointed out that the VIX was down to single digits. It's going to gap higher this morning. There it is. So the S&Ps made new highs without uh, new lows here in the VIX. I would not be short volatility here. And finally, uh, yields. We had this uh, big pullback in yields. Okay. Um, we're, we have this uh, pullback on the consumer confidence, which is a um, backwards or uh, looking indicator. It's not a forward looking indicator. So I think as long as we hold 120, we're going higher. The only thing that gives me pause on um rates making a big move higher would be i still think <clears throat> we're going to have some risk off coming not just today even if we make a new high in the s p's or nasdaq i think risk off is coming and it's hard to want to think yields are going to go up during that time frame so uh that's what i see uh good morning to you stell and uh blake how are you guys doing uh kind of a quiet August, Monday, halfway through the month. The adults will be back from the Hamptons in another two, three weeks. 
Yeah, it's a quiet day. I think we're all waiting for the next couple of weeks to kind of grind. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. until we get to Jackson Hole. And yeah. unfortunately, we're going from one event to the next, and there's there's not enough surprise, let's say, for markets to really move. But uh, you know, we're optimistic. We think at some point uh, something's going to happen. The RBNZ tomorrow evening, tomorrow night, is expected to hike. First yeah. central bank to do so. No, I no, 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 no. No, what? No, no, you can't say that. What do you? What is Banksico like? Chop liver? I mean, <laughs> come on, man. Good yeah, morning, guys. I, you're right. Jay I think Blake. the Bank of Nigeria also uh, hiked. <laughs> and, and Bali. Hey, no, Banksico Bali. did. They, they, they did. They did. Give yeah, us a surprise <laughs> um, rate. I know a lot of people don't think of Banksico as you know one of. They're, they're definitely not a G8, G10 central bank. But, you know, a lot of us here in the currency market, myself included, trade trade the uh, the peso. And um, they did hike rates. And you're right, though, Stelios, um, the RBNZ is expected to raise rates this week. Yeah, and uh, I think the next one, uh, realistically, is uh, Norges Bank. They've said already that before year end, they're going to hike. The question is when. So yeah. Yeah. And don't forget uh, Afghanistan, the Taliban have tightened by taking control of the <laughs> capital. You know, the, the thing, of, you know, the thing about this, um, you know, the, the whole situation in Afghanistan, I mean, that if you think about it from like a, a, a macro, I guess, perspective, because um, it because it, it, obviously, you know, a lot of people start asking, well, you know, what's happening in Afghanistan? Is that going to affect the markets? My opinion is no, not at this point, but it's going to uh, create a lot of political, you know, it's going to be more of a a political issue moving forward for the Biden administration, which is going to make in turn anything else that they're trying to pass uh, from an economic standpoint, probably a little bit more challenging in the remainder of his, you know, for, probably for the next year or two, or I, you know, moving forward, yeah. I, I would assume that 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 would yeah. be my. He's assumption. got a black eye. He does, yeah, absolutely, he does, and so um, you know, it's. I think that's going to weigh, yeah, that's going to weigh on whatever people are thinking. You know, is going to pass politically moving forward. So anyway, and Maldonado is calling him Jimmy Biden, which is a take on Jimmy Carter. Yeah, <laughs> on his 1970s analogy. Yeah, that you know, I, I actually, I, I could see that totally. Um, so it's going to be interesting to uh, to watch. But um, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because really? people, are, people, no, no, the about yeah. about Afghanistan because people will ask, you know, if, if this is going to affect uh, the markets at all. So, um, well, anyway. you know, I mean, uh, the last big nation I remember leaving with their tail between their legs was uh, Russia. Russia, yeah. And uh, we know what happened to Russia after that. It wasn't a really such a good sign. A few years ago, the whole Soviet Union fell apart after that. Well, I, I, I don't think it was. I don't think the two events were tied. But I think, yeah, the Soviet Union was due to, uh, you know, use um, under Gorbachev's leadership. You know, they, they were going to get... Um, split up at some point eventually. But yeah, I, I agree with Blake. I think the Afghanistan situation is not something that should mark, uh, worry the markets now. And, you know, look at equity markets, okay, we're down a little bit, but really uh, nothing. And, you know, the question is, what 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 uh, implications does this have? You know, Afghanistan is not an oil producing country, it's not something, you know, they export, uh, what is it, rugs and uh, fruit and opium, I think. Yeah. So, so, you know, it is going to be, Something I'm only worth- worried about the opium. So yeah. <laughs> opium. Um, oh, oh, yeah, the market. <laughs> opium, yeah. It's going to be an issue, but at the moment, I don't think it's going to affect markets really um, uh, in any, any, any serious way, let's say. Yeah. Okay. Um, and yeah, we're probably not going to be taking a vacation there anytime soon either. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's not in my plans to go. Are there. the fires under control in Greece now? Y- yes, yes. The problem is that they are, they found loads of evidence that it's, it, they were started on purpose, which is very oh, worrying. God, God, I hate arsonists. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. we're All under right. control now. Okay, um, but- opium is life, says uh, Nitish. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, what else we had them um, it's worth mentioning you know markets are a little bit lower um overnight i think the main 
cause is probably not Afghanistan that much. It's uh, China. We had some pretty um, bad misses in uh, industrial production, retail sales. Um, so it looks like the Chinese economy may be starting to stutter a little bit. Um, but as I said before, I think all this is relatively insignificant ahead of uh, the Fed uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Um, and, if, and, and if you're, you know, you're looking at their equity markets, uh, like I was just pulling up uh, for everybody here, like here's here's Shanghai. You know, we had a little bit of a scare a couple of weeks back where, where we plunged through some support and, you know, the, the market's not really moving there. And, you know, the hang saying, you know, kind of saying oh, that looks thing. worse. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, you know, this is. I mean, all, all these Asian markets all look the same. You had this, you know, sell off a few weeks ago and then a, kind of a recovery, but we're, we're just, you know, consolidating like breakaway gap. It's, it's summer, man. It's summer. Yeah. What are we, we we're, you know, I mean, are we going to get a whole lot? I mean, you look at, I'm just going to give you guys a little heads up. You look at our team, uh, you know, we're missing Amanda's out. She's, 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 she's got her feet in the sun somewhere uh ryan's out for the next 10 days he's he's out you know camping with his family uh out in the wilderness i think yeah i think he's taking his kids out teaching them how to uh poop in the forest um you know (laughs) yeah what you what you what you have to teach every boy i'm by the way just so you guys know yeah and you Um, teach them now to use poison ivy toilet paper uh no you know you got everybody's got to keep a poop bag you know with Uh, them with some toilet uh, paper like you know it's all you got to keep it in you know waterproof Oh, yeah, we do that all the stuff. Anyway, um, <laughs> remind me never to go. Remind me never to go on holidays with you, Blake. <laughs> you no, know, I'm telling you, I'm gonna. I'll, I'll teach you how to dig a hole. You know, get rid no, of it. No, thank you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, uh, oh, I got to tell Steve, you, guys, a Steve is out here. as well, right? Steve yeah, Steve is, is out. Islands. Steve, yeah. Steve's on holiday for the next. He's he's in uh, Rhodes. No, Corfu. He's Corfu. been on Corfu. holiday all month. Corfu. I, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's that's a Greek for you. I mean, no offense, but uh, but no, I mean, we got we got Steve out. We've got, I mean, that's just the market. I mean, most most of Europe is away right now. I mean, our our uh, our chat rooms are fairly quiet because a lot of Europeans are out. I mean, it's just you know, it's just the way it is. But anyway, I you know, this is summer markets, and we're going to continue to see the markets probably tighten up, but. I want to point out just a couple of things really quick because I know I talked about this on the um, the week ahead video, just the consolidation that we've seen in the markets. Like here is the here is the Kiwi dollar ahead of the RBNZ, and uh, you know we do have the rate decision as Stelius is pointing out, but this isn't tonight. This is actually to, well Wednesday morning, which is Tuesday night for most of us. Right. And so we still have another, you know, 36 hours of consolidation here. And, you know, you look at the Kiwi, it's not going anywhere, but you look at the Aussie and this continues to show you how weak the Aussie dollar is, whoops, um, as a, as a currency. I mean, the, hold on, you've been sorry. pounding the table on that for months. Yeah, I actually just closed out a pattern in play in the Aussie, um, not not on the Aussie, uh, or I'm sorry, I'm, it's not a pattern in play. Uh, I do have a pattern in play for the Aussie short, and actually Greg had put one in earlier today. Uh, you can see it, that this is, you know, um, uh, a pattern in play that was put in on the 11th, so last week, but in the chat room uh, here, I'll just show you guys. So those of you that are in the chat room or not in the chat room, you can see in in the trades room, uh, I closed a um, uh, uh, Aussie yen short for 95 pips from 81.15 average. Some people got better prices than me, um, but I closed half of it last night and then the other half today. So last night, I think I closed the other half at... Uh, for 54 pips. Um, and then I took the remainder nice. off this morning. It, yeah. And the reason why I did that, just so you guys can see, well, first of all, it's summertime, right? But um, we were at horizontal support um, overnight. You know, we were, we were we were like right around these levels. And I'm like, okay, we're in Asia. Yeah. I'm not sure if they're going to run this through the rest of, you know, European trade. And we were coming through like some of this horizontal support. 
And, um, you know, it was a 127% extension of this movement. So I, you know, I, I didn't want to like overstay my welcome on a lot of it. So I took a lot of it off the table here. Then I took the remainder off this morning because look, you know, this is a big, you know, 161% extension um, down in the Aussie end. And I know we're near some key support. So, but you'd mentioned it, right, um, Dale, the Aussie is very heavy and it trades heavy and it continues to trade heavy. I mean, you can see, I, I mean, I'm looking at the Aussie dollar still pointing towards, you know, 71, this, this flag pattern here, you know, still points to 71, um, 71 and, and change. So, you know, I look at the Aussie and I think it's still got a, a ways to go. And, and that's, that's really the same for a lot of these dollar pairs. You know, I think a lot of people came in to this week, very, um, uh, what should I, a very, bearish bearish, the dollar. very bearish, the dollar. They came in, yeah. you know, very bearish, the dollar. I, I saw, chart after chart after chart like you know everybody just saying oh you know yeah, big rejection the arrow dollar down yeah. yeah big ugly candles so you know you got people trying to fight that trend first thing in the first thing uh in the week and they're getting you know kind of run over at this moment probably some stops over friday's high did friday's high take out the previous uh high at the near the same level for the dollar index, no, it yeah. didn't. And and uh, okay, so I, it, it, but so this there could be a stop hunt above that then. Oh well, probably. well you you know everybody. The first thing that comes to everybody's uh, everything every the first thing that comes to everybody's mind when they see resistance hold, first yeah. thing is what dollars. it's a double top. It, it's a double top. It you know it's a double. It, Especially it being the dollar and everyone's proclivity to want to be bearish. Yeah, right, right, exactly. And and I and I'll tell you have you guys ever seen and let me let me let me find let me do this. I'm going to pull up a uh uh give me a stock that I'd never ever look. crude oil is hitting lows by the way and which is putting the dollar Canadian at highs and the US dollar Nor Norwegian krona at highs. Give me well, you know what? I'll just do this. I never look at this dollar index and whatever it is called. Okay. Stelius, you still here? Nope. Okay, good. Um, so whenever you, you you know you see an asset rally, right, and it hits a high, and this is what I'm talking about with the dollar index. Everybody at this point in time automatically thinks, oh, you know, that's a double top. You know, it's it's not going any higher. But have you guys ever seen like a you know bullish wedge develop? Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's that's what can happen when you have a bullish trend develop into into something that you know at first you go oh look it's a double top but you know if if the underlying asset is bullish like I look at the euro uh, the dollar why why would I say the dollar is bullish I mean in in essence why I mean I, I look at the dollar and I and I see it and let me just delete this really quick. You know, I look at the dollar index and I go, OK, well, you know, the dollar is setting up. You know, we have some obviously some key resistance. But why is it why is the underlying asset bullish? Well, my opinion is that the Fed is looking to taper asset purchases and uh, they are going to be moving a lot quicker than probably most central banks at this point. Right. And the big double bottom is more significant than the recent small double top. Yeah, or or you could really say the the um, you know again I, I can go back to the end of 2020 when in, the dollar was the quote unquote best short of 2021, yeah. and we made a, a a higher low. So now the risk in 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 this case is that we are going to break higher. And like I said, I'm I'm still targeting 94, 94 and change. We could even go higher than that. It depends on you know, if we have any type of risk aversion that uh, plagued the market and how aggressive is it? So anyway, just some food for thought for those of you that think, oh, the dollar is done here. It's not going higher. I, I, I would respectfully disagree with that. And, and that's, I mean, that's my view. And I don't, I, it doesn't mean that I'm right. And, you know, everybody else is wrong. I'm just saying that overall, you have to, re you have to respect the fact that the dollar has been holding up very well in this environment. And that's probably due to everybody 
thinking that the Fed is going to be raising rates in the in 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 the you know raising rates. I'm sorry, um, reducing liquidity over the next few months quicker rather than later due to inflationary pressures and a very robust economy. I mean, you know, I know a lot of people might think, oh, but you know, the economy is not really you know, it's, 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 it's really not that great. No, it is actually really good. Right. Blake, we have to also, yeah. sorry to interrupt. We have to also, no, listen. Please. we have to listen to what the Fed, um, uh, you know, members are telling us. And one thing which was a little bit surprising to me, at least, um, Minneapolis Fed um, President Neil Kashkari, you know, this guy has been the biggest dove of doves. I saw and, him in the mummy. Yeah. And he said basically that, um, a few more strong jobs reports over the coming months would be enough for the Fed to start tapering. So even he's giving us um, his kind of green light for tapering, uh, provided that data continues to be good. So, you know, we have to look at what they're telling us and the majority now are telling us that this is coming. The market still kind of believes them, but uh, maybe he's not convinced about the pace of tapering. But uh, I'm starting to think that this is... Uh, that the surprise might be on the um, to the high side, you know, on the hawkish side, like you say, and I, that's the danger. Do you guys see him in the mummy too? I didn't see. I just read about what he said. I didn't see him. Oh, <laughs> that's yeah. Good. I mean, he's, <laughs> no, good. he's been in the yeah. Look, here he is here, and then you know, here is in the mummy. <laughs> I, I always it does like, look like I always, him. Yes, I, I remember the very first time I saw him on CNBC, which was when he first joined. Um, um, uh, and it wasn't, he wasn't even at the Minneapolis Fed at that point, or was he? Yeah. I anyway, thought, by I the way, before what... I thought you, I thought you were saying in the money, you know, the show on. Uh, oh, no, I meant in the mummy. But <laughs> yeah, and I was like, when he left, when he left Goldman and he joined the Fed and, uh, and, you know, he first j- jumped on CNBC, I must have been like eight, nine, 10 years ago. I was like, <laughs> dude, that guy's in the mummy. And, you know, obviously it's a thing. It's a thing anyway. But yeah, you know, this is the, this is the, this is the, the thing about um, the Fed governors, you you see them all. And I mentioned this during the the week ahead video, guys, they're all falling in line and they're all, they're all, all the little soldiers are falling in line. And so all we need to hear now is from the big kahuna himself, you know, pals, you know, Pal turns, uh, you know, turns hawkish and do, game on, baby. Game on. Yeah, right? Kaplan was very uh, aggressive with the call. He said, well, it's like a doctor giving you medicine and it's no longer helping and all you're getting are side effects from it. Well, yeah. He's talking about the, you know, bond buying. Yeah. So, and, yeah. you know, isn't this funny, Dale, that we actually had the same conversation probably two years ago? Yeah, it's like, you know, at times this business uh, feels like Groundhog Day. It it does. You know, and it does. And I guess it feels even more like that for us uh, because we, you know, before COVID happened, you know, we were at that. We were, I I felt the exact same way as I do right now. And, And I was like, man, you know, we've had this quote unquote emergency, you know, monetary policy for you know seven years now and it's like oh my god it's never gonna end it's like get yeah, please get me off of this roller coaster Paul and uh and and then covid hit you know obviously the market finally corrected but not due to you know the fed reducing liquidity they just slapped on another three times the amount so hey you know here's the thing um uh, we could go round and round and round about this subject, but guess what? We have a special guest here today um, for the next few minutes because Dale, I know you have an interview. Um, uh, Polly, Paul Franco is here with us. Paul, good hey, morning, Polly. Hey, how you doing? Hey, welcome, bro. What's happening, hey, man? What, Polly? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear no, me? What's, what's, yeah. So yeah. for those of you that don't know Paul Franco, uh, you know, here's Polly and um, Polly. He does our European crossover webinar that's specifically or exclusively, excuse me, for um, the uh, Forex Analytics subscribers. But Polly is like 
scalper extraordinaire in the NASDAQ. Uh, you know, he's like, well, Polly, tell us a little bit about what you're doing. And, and I know you're in the chat rooms. So you're super active in our chat rooms, but how, what are you, what are you, what markets are you slaying nowadays? What's got your attention? Well, I mean, I, I primarily trade the NASDAQ now, but I, I do trade a little bit of uh, S&Ps. I kind of keep those in tandem. And then also a little bit with the crude oil. Um, we caught, uh, actually, the other day, I, uh, I was targeting, when we broke down, we were targeting a move to, I think it was on the September contract. I think it was 66.24. Anyway, the low was 66.15, so we missed the low by nine cents. And I got long, but I ended up scalping out of it. I didn't get back in it. But we were looking last week. I was calling for a, a look like we had a pretty good resistance of 69.40, which is exactly where the market ran out of gas. It was six or 66.40. I don't know because we rolled over to October. I have to go back to the chart. But I never did get back in it. But we just sat there for about a day, a day and a half, almost two days. And boy, did right we there. break. We eventually broke down. And uh, now we're down at 66.24. That's the October crude because I've already rolled into it. Yeah, it was 69.40. Then it was 69.40 on the September. We sat there. Actually, had a guy short. It only felt like about 25 cents. It came right back, and it vacillated. Eventually, it did break below 69, but it popped right back into that 69.30s to 40s area. And then finally, we rolled over, and boy, did we roll over. We saw a pretty good sell-off. We actually have support on the bias chart this morning. Actually, we're below it. We had support at 66.58 on the buy charts, so we're just a little bit below, but there's some good support down here, but it's probably just because we're starting out Monday and probably caught some people short or long over the weekend. So maybe they're pressing them into the cash open. You know, one of the, uh, I, I want to mention that, and thanks Paul for your update regarding crude. And, you know, this is kind of like the opposite of, uh, of the dollar index. You know, everybody's looking at crude and they're like, double bottom, that's a double bottom, you know? And then you start looking at it and you're like, is it, you know, is that a double bottom or are we just developing a bearish wedge where, you know, eventually, you know, it's going to take all these longs of the cleaners. Uh, I did, I did have a conversation with Bill Baruch from uh, Blue Line Futures last week, and he's, he's very much a crude bull he, and he's looking to buy crude, you know, on a dip down towards the 200 day moving average, which at this point in time comes in above 60. It was below 60 last week, but now we're like 60. 60, 40 or so, and that's where the 200 day moving average, but it does look like crude crude could correct a little bit here, right? Yeah, it looks, uh, one of the things, if you go back to that, that the amount of time that we stood there and it wasn't even that long, but we had that nice bounce off of that 66, 24 area and yep. we kept rallying, we took a, a dip back and then we ran up to 69, 40. And while we're sitting there, I said, you know, we, it was like the, the following day and I said, well, you know what, uh, if we break above here, it's a quick shock to 70, 70, 27. The point is they had the chance to the longs really had the chance to skewer some bears there and they couldn't do it. And it sat there for a couple of days and even made one more run on, I guess it was on the 13th back above $69. And that's what I'm saying is it just couldn't do it anymore. It's just, this is reminiscent on a very short time <clears throat> basis, <clears throat> but it's reminiscent of exactly what happened with gold. If you think about it, when gold was up there at 18 and, uh, and it couldn't bounce above any higher, and it kept breaking back to 1802, maybe just a little bit sub 18. And it come right back. And I, uh, if you were following on the whatchamacall on the um, the uh, our European crossover webinar, I was beating the hell out of this thing. I didn't trade it. I'm saying I was beating the hell out of it from a from a technical standpoint, saying, "Look, this thing just can't go any higher. It's going to break lower." Now I never thought it would break like that, but I thought it could go down to 1740. But then. You know, uh, two Sundays before, not this Sunday, but the Sunday before, all hell broke loose because the same thing of what you're seeing, at looking, if you're looking at crude on a very short term basis, like a two hour basis, you, it's the same thing that happened. The, the, the wheels fell off the caboose on this crude from $69. Now, here we are almost down to 66 because all those longs just got thrashed out. You see the same thing with you. Yeah, you look at your chart there with, with uh, gold. You see those two blue lines? And I was saying how it kept rotating above it. And we had the, the, the VWAP off of the lows back in March uh, was coming in at 1818. I go, hey, there's a resistance. There's a resistance. And I said, if we get above 1824, we can jump up to 1873. We did, but then it just floundered for a day and we came back. So we broke down into 18. We made one more rally again. And I'm saying, look, this is looking terrible. And look where your look where your uh your trend line intersects. If you look up the uh, just to the left, 
You know, to the left, a little bit higher. No, the downtrend line, the downtrend line. Right there. Okay, right. Now move a look. Okay. Do you see that bearish engulfing, that uh, uh, bearish engulfing bar? You got it right there. You got it right at the top. There you go. Just to the right. Move to the right a little bit more. Move to the right. Move that right yeah. there. Okay. On that day, that's when the, when all of a sudden they blew the stops on the upside. And within yeah. a two-hour period, not only did they blow the stops, they turned around and gave back, I think it was uh, $20 or something. That already told you right there it was over. They had one more last gasp, and then they blew it. Not only did they, not only did they blow it, they actually gave the entire move and then some back within a two-hour bar. And then you can see, look at the rest. Look how it drips. And it just and bleeds then, our... Yeah, now yeah. I thought my hey. move, I was thinking, I go, okay, we're probably going to... I remember that day I said... We have support of 1792. Well, actually, it was 1802, but I said, look for 1792. Maybe we'll make it down to 1777. Well, that the market closed, but on Sunday, they opened around that 1773, and then they broke, and then all heck broke loose. Well, it's in, but in a uh, crude right now, in a two-hour chart, is a microcosm of that, because once again, we were at that $69, and we kept pushing up against it, pushing up against it, and then all of a sudden, all hell broke loose right now. Yeah, that 6940 wasn't even that much of a rally back. So when you see here, if they really wanted to spook them, I mean, they could have goosed them up there and taken us to 7027. So the fact that we're coming back down here, think of all the disappointed bulls. Even if this was a buy, and I, uh, we were discussing that uh, this morning on the European crossover webinar, I said, look, when a market dips down there, I've been the kind of person that'll try and catch a knife down there. But one thing you have to remember is when you get that dip and you've got those disappointed longs, gold was a perfect example. At that point, no one's going to try and defend on a, uh, on a dip back like the same way the S&Ps were. They try and defend it because once you get that hard break, forget it. All bets are going to be off. We're going to we're going to slide through that. And gold was just like a unbelievable uh, issue with that. And that's where I'm getting back to the S&Ps is well, I'm telling people, be careful with the s and I'm not bearish. Technically, it's still bullish. But the problem is, is and I shared that in the chat room, and I even shared it on Twitter, the volume in the spies is the lowest weekly volume that we've had in five years, excluding Christmas week of 2019 and Thanksgiving week of 2017. So the key thing what we're saying here is that you're going higher and higher, but but the support keeps getting less and less. So if we do break this morning, the support is going to be 44.34. It's going to be a nasty one, right? It's good, exactly. Hey, you, but don't hey, wanna, hey, you don't hey, want to be a dead buyer. Because hey. what will happen is we're going to dip. You might see, and I told people, the key level is going to be 44.12. You might get a little bit of a bounce up to 44.20 in the mid-20s. But what's going to happen, everybody's going to load the boat. And from 44.12, I think we'll drop down to about 43.96. And we might even drop into the 43.80s. I'm not saying today. I'm just saying when we get that first break. And last week was the first week that I've seen, and it was actually the beginning of the month, where we didn't see, and if you look at NASDAQ, usually, you know, you and I've been there on the wrong side, you get short and like, oh my God, how could I have done that? It's a Monday, and the market just really tears you up. We didn't see that on Monday, and if you remember last Monday, I was in the chat room saying it, and I was in Twitter talking about it. I said, look, this market feels heavy. It feels like uh, it's a car that's running out of gas, and you step on the gas, and maybe you'll get one more boom and that'll be it well we closed at our highs on Polly, Friday, on monday Polly, the next morning the bottom pa fell Polly, out and we kept on falling Polly, hey hey we have we have an interview um okay. but he's you, so passionate man he is man i i love yeah. it Polly. hey and and here guys if you want to get more of paul franco <laughs> you gotta listen to him on the on the on the on the yeah. european crossover and Polly, we love having you here because i and that's the thing i i mean good win look, too Polly. look I, i've yeah he's uh i brought on even have to breathe when you do analysis, I, I brought great. Polly on years ago <laughs> with uh, our team over at the over at mb trading and yeah. uh, and you know I, I love having him here because he trades for a living. He's passionate. He's always in the markets. Always, always, always trading. And uh, anyway, he's Paul. You're great. Thanks for being yeah. on with us this morning. Okay, y'all have a good one. Bye. Hey, Thanks, I'll, we'll, I'll see you guys. In, I'll see you in the chat room. And yeah. um, guys, just remember, uh, you know, to take advantage of Forex Analytics, make sure you uh, you you try it out. It's only one dollar for ten days. And I want to mention this: our webinar sponsor is MB or is uh, is is not only Pepperstone Trading, but it's really um, 
Forest Park FX. So make sure you guys, if if you have, if you're in the US, you're in Europe, doesn't matter where you're at, make sure you check out Forest Park FX because if you're not getting paid, I just actually uh I I um uh had to switch my account over one of my accounts over to uh Forest Park Forest Park. I actually received my first uh check uh and uh cash check in the mail. <laughs> That's awesome. <Nice. laughs> my rebate check. I'm like, yeah, this is great. So anyway, yeah, you got just you keep turning cash. yourself, bro. It's cool, man. It's cool. I, get, I like, I don't yeah. know why I never got cash. Well, I know why I wasn't getting cash back rebates yeah. for many years because yeah. I was trading through, you know, they got J- JP Morgan in, in oh, an yeah, institutional account and I couldn't trade my own. I couldn't trade my own personal FX account. So, uh, yeah. So anyway, all right. All right. Yeah. Well, Jim Carroll, uh, is with us, Vixologist. All so, right. So, uh, maybe you'll have some, uh, follow-up commentary to what Paulie was saying. Hey, Jim, uh, I can't promote you to, um, a panelist. Did you call in? I'm going to let you talk. There you are. Hi, Jim. Can you hear me now? I can, Jim. How are you? Outstanding. I am great. Thank you. Did you call in? Uh, I'm in the Zoom. Okay, but you called the Zoom, No, right? I didn't call, I oh, don't think. Oh, okay. Uh, can you, let's see if I can get you to uh, share your screen, because I wasn't able to promote you to uh, mm. a panelist. Why don't you try and uh, oh, share hang, the screen? Hang on here. It said Jim. Oh, now you're coming in as a panelist. Okay. I think Blake did it. All right. Now, can you hear me now got you and i to go, think Jim. i'm a panelist yeah yeah now you are outstanding um, you want to share your screen sure it's a green box yep and uh, uh great right time one. to have you on i think um, <laughs> as we you know and i know that you're joking as far as you know what are you gonna say and uh yeah you're a regular now all your friends are asking you if you made the cut you made the cut so <laughs> um so let me thinking? try to share my screen and get here some comes. stuff up here okay there's your twitter screen Give me a second okay uh the vix on the dsi sentiment was a single digits last week gm nine on a sentiment huh. service uh, survey that we use. All right, you see, you see my uh, my slide here. No, I'm still seeing uh, Twitter, so you'll probably have to do mm. stop sharing and then new share. Okay, hold on a second. What's going on? It's weird because I'm seeing it on mine. Yeah. Um, so mm. why don't you just hit the stop share? stop sharing and then hit the screen share again and pick the screen that your slides are on do, 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 which is what i thought i did that's weird now i now i having trouble getting back to the zoom why is that where is that going well let me do this hang okay, on there you go you yeah. got it now now yeah, let me try again sorry for the technical i don't know about the this regular you got some ground to make up now uh, so, <laughs> you know uh i'm you're, always screwing something up dale i is hey that's life that's how you okay, rebound now. or adjust to your screw up so why is something there you go well, i see the red boxes and your slides okay so. perfect Okay, so let me try to us. turn that into a slideshow. Okay. Yeah. So, so I was last with you in April. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, what we've seen since then in VIX land is really, and you know, I'm not a huge fan of technical analysis on the VIX, you know, because it's not tradable. There's no supply demand characteristics, but you know, the reality is that the market has said uh, we're less and less nervous as time has passed, at least until, you know, now. Um, <clears throat> we've had a series of when, when the VIX has spiked, as it, 
is want to do. We've had a series of lower highs with those spikes mm -hmm. and the bottoms, uh, you know, have tended to be moving lower, right? We were, we had just come out of that post pandemic period where the VIX was stuck above 20 when you and right. I last talked. And uh, we've now settled firmly below 20 in terms of the bulk of the moves. You know, we've had a few spikes above 20, but, um, you know, we, we seem to be uh, settling down. Fear seems to be subsiding more broadly, even though, you know, we've got the Delta variant, we've got Fed policy, inflation worries, and now we've got Afghanistan um, trying to pretend it's Saigon all over again. Uh, yeah. But but generally things have just kind of settled down and gone sideways. Um, I think the, you know, did I switch slides on you? Yes. Excellent. Okay. So, you know, <clears throat> looking back, uh, similarly, you know, obviously the S&P 500 has continued to notch new highs. And this is just another sort of peak uh, using a 50-day moving average of the VIX index that shows that we've just kind of slowly receded. You know, fear has been ebbing out of the market. And uh, as you guys were discussing, you know, that the, the $64,000 question is whether that uh, subsiding of fear is appropriate given some of the potential headwinds we're facing. But, right. you know, it kind of is what it is. Um, looking back, uh, when we were talking in April, looking at the SIBO volatility term structure ranging from nine days to a year. Yeah. Um, since then, you know, the short end, here, here's, you know, the beginning of the interesting stuff. The short end has clearly dropped. Uh, but you go out to three, six months and a year, and we really haven't come in that much. So the front end, whether it's using the SIBO term structure, uh, I'll show the VIX futures in a second. The front end has come down, uh, but the back end has stayed high. We've really steepened the front end of the volatility term structure. Um, and taking that SIBO term structure and looking at one of the relationships, this is the relationship between VIX 30 days and VIX three months, which stock charts still uses VXV, the old nomenclature. But you know this shows how that relationship, uh, the lower the chart on the bottom goes, the steeper that relationship between 30-day volatility and three-month volatility is. And you can see that currently we're at very steep levels, very low levels for that ratio. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to say that that uh, indicates that the market's at a high and we're going to turn around, but it just tells you that conditions are stretched. Yeah, you know, it's tough that's to get... For sure. It's tough to get that relationship to be steeper. Um, and generally, when the term structure flattens, it's not a good thing for equities. Okay, and so we so, go from steepening to flattening to backwardation would be the next step to where- Backwardation uh, the, would be the next step. We haven't seen that in so long that it's hard yeah. to remember what it looks like. I mean, are um, they going to ring a bell and give us backwardation uh, on the first break from whenever a major high comes in? Or does that happen after the first break? Uh, they start pricing that in or the term structure shifts. Yeah, you know, in, in my experience, <clears throat> and everybody says, you know, you, you never want to be naked short volatility because you could wake up the next day yeah. and uh, and find out that you're be dead. Broke. Yeah. Um, and, and while that is theoretically true, my experience is that uh, that's not usually what happens. And let's just take this this chart and go back to the start of the pandemic. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, let me see if I can. Yeah, here we go. So, you know, you, you made these you, the, the term structure was really steep back at the end of 20 uh, of 2019. Right. right? And yeah. then what you saw was it started flattening 
as this right. line moves up, it means that the term structure is flattening. Right. And at the end of January, you had, you know, that little pullback, which then everybody said, oh, never mind, everything's okay. And we marched back to new highs. And the term structure, again, began to steep it a little bit, but it never got back nearly as flat as it was before. Yeah. So, you know, if you were short volatility going into the pandemic, really, you weren't paying close attention. At a minimum, you had to be hedged. And, um, you know, that that's just one observation from this. Okay. So you're getting the first signs that... Uh... At you know, least so now, you, you wouldn't be short volatility now that we're uh, compressed like we are right now. Well, you know, it's, it's one of those conditions where you need to be thinking really hard about why you might be positioned. And, and again, as, we've, as we talked about on the last show, you know, there are a thousand ways to be short volatility. There aren't that many ways realistically to be long volatility without bleeding to death. Uh, yeah. But you do need to be What's asking What's the best yourself, way where it's only a it's only a cut and not a hemorrhage. <laughs> well, you know, there are, and, and I am not your options expert. You know, I, I uh, hang around with a lot of people who, you know, are pretty sophisticated in how they can put themselves into a position where they've got some long volatility exposure while minimizing the bleed. It's not easy. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things where, uh, timing can be everything um, because you don't want to spend your whole life being long volatility. Uh, no. It's just not going to pay off. And, um, you know, so, so I think any way you, you look at it, uh, I would argue that there's an element of timing that is useful uh, to yes. be long vol all the time is just, is not to me is not a smart way to play it. You know, okay. you, there've been a lot of studies done on hedging portfolios, uh, AQR did one that's been widely read, you know, looking at hedging portfolios with, uh, with index puts um, and how it really just is not very efficient. Um, but, you know, it's one of the big product innovations of the last couple of years are um, exchange traded funds that offer downside protection. I mean, it's like hotcakes. Uh, they are selling fast and furious. And, you know, I think uh, every investor who's paying attention has concerns that some of these all-time highs can be taken out of their portfolios in relatively short order. So everybody's looking for the answer. And the, the, the truth is that, you know, there's, there's no free lunch uh, trying to hedge a portfolio or go long volatility. Yeah. In fact, you know, what I, uh, the sentiment and, what I'm getting is that people are saying, why should I hedge? It's a waste of money. And, and you know, they've been right since, uh, you know, the lows of the COVID crash. And, uh, you know, but you don't buy fire insurance for your house hoping there's going to be a fire. No, you right? don't. And, and yeah. I think um, one of the challenges. Well, I think most I, are I work... unhedged and uh, heavily margined. You know, you I work think? with I work with a lot of you know uh, smart people um, uh, who hire me as an advisor because this is not what they do. You know, they're right. really good at what they do, and they need some help on the investing side. The biggest challenge I find is um, people sticking to a strategy when markets get a little wiggy. Um, you know, we can look back now and it's easy to look back and say, hey, that whole COVID thing was kind of a non-event at the end of the day. All you had to do was hunker down and, and stick to your program and it all worked out. But, you know, the first week of or the second week of March 2020, uh, a lot of people were deeply concerned that, you know, this was going to uh, be ugly on a sustained basis. And, and getting people comfortable that the strategy they have is going to reach, accomplish their objectives uh, and is something that they can stick with through the easy times and the tough times is the big challenge. And that's why uh, some people feel comfortable having a hedge in their portfolio, even if they know that uh, it's not necessarily optimal from a return standpoint. 
it helps them sleep at night. It helps them stick with their strategy. And at the end of the day, that probably is the right decision to make. Okay. I know you're a little hesitant, but let's just say for yourself, then you're not recommending it for anyone. What would be your way of hedging a market that has become parabolic and stretched like this? Um, so, for you, you know, Jim. look, yeah, I, I am a, uh, a volatility guy and, and I use the uh, exchange traded products uh, that are out there. Um, uh, I'm working with some folks I know to try and introduce some new ones. And we hope uh, we've been hoping for a while. It's kind of roadblocked at the SEC. But, um, you know, I will from time to time take a position long volatility through the exchange traded products as a way Once. to hedge a portfolio. You know, that can be VXX, could be UVXY, used to be TVIX, rest in peace. On the short side, it used to be XIV, SVIXI, you know, is, is available now. And, and those are tools that I will use, but systematically and, and again, with some element of timing, yeah. uh, to, to give myself and some of my clients exposure either on the short side or the long side of volatility. Okay. And um, uh, when you are implementing this, uh, you know, I mean, we've been in an ongoing bull market, so there's mm -hmm. not even any perception of uh, anything, but like you address COVID, which was, I don't know, a 30, 40% uh, decline that happened mm -hmm in a few weeks and disappeared in a few months. Right. Um, what's the average hold time for anyone that you would advise? And, and what if we end up having some type of, instead of being a crash this time, mm -hmm. we end up having, you know, a garden variety bear market that, you know, can last, you know, six to 12 months and, uh, and not just be kind of like a flash crash and it's over. Uh -huh. uh, is there a way to, you know, position yourself or do you always have to be a trader when you're using these things? You know, to me, if you're using uh, and, and again, most of the people that I know who play in this space are traders. They don't view okay. themselves as long term investors, uh, although there are some long volatility funds. Okay that tend to stay long volatility um, and, and may, you know, during a crash period, monetize some of their gains to reinvest. Um, but most of the people I know who work this space are traders. They have a, some systematic approach, either in the options markets, the futures markets, um, you know, obviously being short equities is long volatility. And, you know, I know people who use the inverse equity ETFs as a way to express a long volatility position, right? If you know the S&P is going down 10% in the next three weeks, yeah. you know, you buy the triple inverse and, uh, and, and you're going to have fun. Um, okay. You can also get your face ripped off. <laughs> uh, there's an interesting question. Uh, I don't know if he's a follower of yours uh, from uh, Lincoln, Washington. You right. Know, uh, he was saying, uh, Jim, be interesting to hear you talk about the more than normal spread between VIX and VX1, VX2, this close to VIX spiration, how well, that normally runs and how that compares to the last two days and tomorrow. So let's do that. See, um, you know, I mean, uh, when you need something to talk about, there's always someone with a good question. So, so quickly, you know, again, drawing the contrast between the last time we talked and today, uh, it's, it's interesting that the uh, VIX futures term structure, you know, is not dramatically different. And again, interestingly, you can see that the back end uh, is, is anchored at a relatively high level, still right around 24 yeah. Um, the front end has come down and it's relatively steep. Um, I, I posted this to Twitter. Um, you know, this was a close on Friday. Um, and the front month future, which expires Wednesday morning, uh, was at 1670 against a 15, 
45 VIX. Obviously, VIX has popped up today. Yeah. Uh, so it looks like the futures guys had it right. Um, but that that spread of one and a quarter points with three days to expiration was, you know, call it three times the normal spread with three days to expiration. Uh, so and, and the spread between the second month and spot was, you know, again, sort of 3x what you would expect with three days to expire for the front month. So the spreads, the front end has been very steep. The spreads have been very wide. Um, no one wants to give them away. No one wants to give them away. And so, so the bet is on, right? Because if you think that VIX is going to stay in the 15s until expiration Wednesday morning, then you want to sell that front end future. Um, and I think part of the reason that the term structure has been as steep as it is, is because there have been people selling that front end against a declining VIX, uh, because that looked like a you know, reasonable probability to make some money. Um, you know, today has kind of shaken it up a little bit. We'll see what happens. I'm a little bit, you guys were talking about it a bit before, um, you know, the situation in Afghanistan to me was pretty predictable the end of last week. I mean, it's not like Kabul yeah. wasn't going to fall. Yeah. So it always kind of amuses me to see uh, the future selling off on this quote unquote news, uh, which to me, I, I don't know how, how is yeah. this news? Well, but, yeah. You know, I mean, you know, just, uh, you know, the process it's in um, uh, Charles uh, Norzimer is saying it was predictable a month ago. Right. Uh, what was going to happen there? You know uh, we don't have a lot of time left, but you know, I'd like your opinion. If I could just share my screen, unless there was another, no, slide. I'm done. Oh, really? Okay. I want to ask you this since you trade the VIX, okay? Um, you need me to give you the screen back? Or can no, you I got it. it. Got it's it. coming to me. So um, here we go. So I want to ask you about this because it was something I was noticing um, for quite a while. It was back. Maybe it was here. Okay. You see all the way to the left in here? Yes. Where I had my cursor? Yes. You see these wicks? Yes. And if I go <laughs> to the left, it, there were more of them. Yes. Okay. Where it would open down here. Did anything really ever trade when the, these prices were showing up? And to you who watches the VIX a lot more than I do, did this smack of accumulation that, you know, they would try and take it down near the opening, but probably hardly even trade it down here before the candle closed. I know this is a four hour, but uh, yeah. we were even having these kind of wicks on a 15 minute TF. Yeah. So, so again, everybody has to remember that you can't buy or sell the VIX index. So the VIX index is calculated from the values of S and P 500 index options. And um, you, you can go back and, and in, you know, with an extended hours chart, see those wicks uh, fairly regularly, typically at about 8.30 Eastern time. So yeah. pre the market opening. Yeah. And I've quizzed any number of people, you know, what the heck is going on? What, what is this? And the best answer I've gotten, and I don't know if it's the right answer, is that you've got market makers essentially resetting their bid ask in these S and P yeah. put structures, and so you sort of have a little flicker. You know, I yeah. I, I I hit the reset button, <laughs> right? And for and for an instant, uh, it pulled my bids and offers uh, from the market, and so the market said, "Hey, wait a minute! You know, no, nobody wants these things. Um, VIX has to go down." Uh, okay. So, it, it, as as best I can tell from people that I've talked to, you know, it's one of these uh, strange little anomalies. And again, it's 
it, it, VIX is not something that trades. It, it's quoted, but it doesn't trade. Okay. So uh, what's the best way for people to follow you and learn more about the VIX? Do you have them on Twitter or do you have yes, a website? Twitter's, Twitter's the best place. Um, at at VIXologist. Vixologist. Yes. Uh, okay. And I am, uh, uh, I do advise uh, private clients uh, from the Toroso platform, T-O-R-O-S-O-I-N-V.com. And okay. uh, happy to engage. DMs are open. Just don't okay. hate me too much. All right. Well, Jim, thanks so much. You're Again. welcome, Dale. Yeah, I, I really here. appreciate you being here because, you know, it's uh, a lot of this is foreign to me. And, uh, you know, if it is to me, I'm sure there are a lot of people that got some clarity today with uh, some of the slides that you showed. I appreciate your giving nature to come in here and share your hard work with us. Well, I'm happy to do it, Dale, anytime. All right, everyone. So that, that's going to be a wrap. We'll see everyone for Turnaround Tuesday. Jim Carroll, thank you very much for being with us today. Follow Jim on Twitter, at Vixologist. Uh, for anyone, I think people are going to uh, start paying more attention to the VIX in the next 30 days. And uh, Jim would be a great uh, intelligence gathering source for you. And that's a wrap. Remember, don't just count your volatility, count your blessings. And uh, we'll talk to everyone tomorrow. Adios, good hunting. And you could join the crew in 14 minutes on Morning Edge. And that's going to be a wrap. See everyone tomorrow. Thank you. See you, Jim. Thanks, Dale. Adios.